Guangdong will take the advice from African countries and further develop its measures on managing foreign nationals in the city. And according to the report, many Africans are returning to their home in Guangdong and are now under quarantine. And some of them who have difficulties are also being taken care of by the government. Well, time now for a short break. Here's what's still ahead on Africa Live. Coming up, we look at how citizens are coping with lockdown conditions in various parts of Africa. And what online learning platforms are offering in the wake of a school shutdown in Nigeria. How will your world change today? What happens here? What happens there? Or what you make happen for yourself? If it matters to you, it matters to us too. Your stories are the stories that need to be told. Africa Live. Find your voice. A number of African nations have been ramping up coronavirus containment measures. Niger has extended its nighttime curfew by another two weeks, and there's a possibility that the curfew could be extended again. Niger has now reported nearly 600 cases of COVID-19, with 14 deaths. Unlike other West African countries, Niger's national police force implements different stages of the curfew enforcement. First comes raising awareness a few hours before the 7 p.m. cut-off time. We ask everyone to respect the curfew and to protect themselves and others. It is not too early to enforce the curfew at 7 p.m. And it is true that it starts at 7 p.m. But our officers will continue outreach on the ground until 8 p.m. to help citizens to get back to their homes. On pickup truck, officers patrol near maize arteries crowded with small traders. Here, they invite the population to return home before the curfew hour. Honestly, I think it's a little early to start curfew at 7 p.m. For me, it should start at 9 p.m. and end at 5 a.m. Lots of economic activities usually work very well between 7 p.m. and midnight. After raising awareness, the police start the control phase. The head of the security force gives final instructions before his team is deployed to the field. Those who refuse to comply are arrested in accordance with the procedures to be followed. It's not about beating people. If people are stubborn, they have to be disciplined and taken on board. More specifically, the process of arrestation starts at 8 p.m., but before 8 p.m., those who are still outside have to be escorted home. Overall, the cafe is respected in Niger's capital, even if it has a negative impact on some economic activities. Chom Gono, CGTN. Uganda, meanwhile, has extended both its coronavirus lockdown and curfew for another 21 days. The country's Ministry of Health says it still needs to test over 18,000 travelers who arrived in the country in March. Isabel Nakiria reports. Ugandans will have to continue staying home till the 5th of May. President Museveni says the country needs to fight and defeat the disease in the next 21 days. But some Ugandans say life is hard without work. I have 30 workers, but each of them is calling me asking me for money, telling me to send them food. I have run out of money. Right now, we no longer work. We have no jobs, we need food, and we need to take care of our children. Our children will soon be going back to school. We need money. More than 50 cases of COVID-19 have been reported, but the health ministry believes it could be higher. It's trying to track down more than 18,000 people who arrived in March using the passenger manifest. The government sealed its borders and cancelled all international flights after a passenger on board an Ethiopian Airlines flight tested positive in late March. 
The country has also started testing cargo drivers who are continuing to ply the East African region. Other measures like the ban on public and private transport and social gatherings will stay. The extension of the lockdown comes after the WHO warned countries against lifting restrictions too early as it could lead to a deadly resurgence of the disease. Isabel Nakiria, CGTN Kampala, Uganda. In South Africa's Western Cape province, leaders of the African National Congress have accused provincial and city authorities of rounding up Cape Town's homeless in what they're calling an inhumane centralized camp. Renaud Dolcam has the story. It's the third week of South Africa's national lockdown, and it's eerily quiet at the Strandfontein Pavilion on the outskirts of Cape Town. Just a few kilometers away is the local sports complex, which the city of Cape Town has turned into temporary emergency accommodation for around 2,000 of its homeless people. But the site has already caused plenty of controversy. City officials say it was set up quickly under the instruction of South Africa's COVID-19 national disaster regulations. But ANC officials want heads to roll, especially after an 18-year-old woman living in one of the tents was allegedly raped a few days ago. We issued an alert that we will be coming here to do our oversight role as official opposition in the city of Cape Town. I mean, a person has been raped here. The city is quiet about it, okay? Nobody wants to take a responsibility. But this delegation of senior ANC officials was denied access to inspect the living conditions at the facility. When President Cyril Ramaphosa met with political leaders across the political spectrum at Parliament just over a month ago, they all agreed to work together in a united, non-partisan fight against COVID-19. But here in the Western Cape, the gloves now appear to be coming off. Between the Democratic Alliance, which runs this province, and the opposition African National Congress. I see this as a kind of a, a mafia style. We are in a mafia city now, okay? Where councillors cannot be allowed to do their work. So, if they are saying then, I'm disrupting, I'm doing whatever, they must do an honourable thing come and arrest me. The worst thing here is that we actually are undermining the national effort to contain the spread of the pandemic because the conditions inside, I think, are rife um, for this pandemic to spread. The ANC says it's imperative that the COVID-19 National Command Council set up by President Cyril Ramaphosa intervenes in this situation. With all what I've heard, we are very clear as ANC, this thing must be shut down. And they vowed to return here as a matter of urgency. Renard Alcom, CGTN, Cape Town, South Africa. Schools across Nigeria are currently shut due to coronavirus lockdowns. An ed tech firm, though, is offering relief to both students and parents through its free digital learning platform. CGTN's Deji Badmus reports. Long before the outbreak of COVID-19, Thomas Ukejo and his partner had founded eSoft Content Limited, a tech firm that caters for education and builds content for students at different levels of education. eSoft has a learning content app called StudyMate, an interactive video textbook for computer and mobile devices which allows students to learn anywhere and anytime in the comfort of their homes. Nobody predicted uh, that COVID-19 is going to happen today. So we developed something that we thought at that time was right to do. You know, we don't have to have crisis to have uh, students learn anywhere at any time. Um, but the good news is that we did that then, and now it's useful to students today. With the ease of study made, a teacher's voice comes up on the screen with instructions. Additional features on the app include a place for knowledge check after each lesson and a forum which allows students to ask questions and get a response from a teacher on standby. This content is available to students in junior secondary school in four core subjects, mathematics, English, basic science and ICT. Normally each unit sells for about $26, but Esoft 
is now given this app for free so that every child gets an opportunity to continue learning and not get too disconnected from their education amid the ongoing lockdown. Now there's no school. It's even dangerous right now to get an home teacher. How will home teacher even get to the child, you know, wherever he or she is? But with this, they can sit back and learn comfortably. We have an SD card that is readily available that we can distribute to the student wherever they might be and they can have it deployed on their tablets or their phones without the need for internet connection and they'll be able to stream all this video content offline. Experience has been good so far. Um, a lot of schools are keen into it and encouraging their students to use the StudyMate app. We're getting registrations every day on a daily basis and uh, students who have doubts about certain topics or questions can easily post it on a forum and other people can collaborate and answer those questions. Currently, over 1,500 students have signed up on the app and Abigail is one of them. She sits with her dad at home while solving some math exercise on her tablet. It's really helping me. Like before, sometimes I didn't really know some topics in mathematics, but now I'm learning it. In my classroom, I didn't really learn much about this, but now I learned so much. Esoft intends to keep its platform free for as long as the COVID-19 lockdown lasts. But beyond that, Thomas Akejo and his partner believe digital textbook, with its ability to complement the work of a classroom teacher, is the future of learning. Dejibatmos, CGTN, Lagos, Nigeria. Well, let's turn to news now coming from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Children from families displaced by violence in Ituri province are leaving displacement camps, choosing to beg on the streets. The growing number of street children is becoming a big concern for residents in Bunia. CGTN's Tuli Shabalala has more. This is Bunia, the capital of Ituri province. This part of the Democratic Republic of Congo has seen conflict among armed groups over ethnicity, natural resources and political power. The violence has killed dozens of civilians and forced many on the streets, including children. When they started killing people in my village, I ran with my mom to Oicha, a city in North Kivu province. We lived with my aunt until my mom died. With nowhere to go, 10-year-old Augustine Muhego begs on the streets of Bunya. I spend my time here on the streets with friends. When one of us gets something, he brings it and we all eat. And if I am the one who has gotten something, I bring it in and we all share. We have no other choice but to live this way. The camps for the displaced are overcrowded and food and other supplies are inadequate. More children are now showing up on the streets, a cause for concern among residents here. This begging is painful for those of us who are parents. We do not want our children to be on the street, but since they do not have enough to eat and what the World Food Program gives them is not enough, this is why you notice that the children are no longer in their camps, they are in the city begging. This is a big concern for me. We do not want this phenomenon to persist. We want this new social system we are seeing in Bunia to stop. 60-year-old Celestine Pigo Panza lives in one of these camps. He has two wives and nine children. Seven of them beg on the streets. We don't have jobs to do. We spend our days doing nothing. We have nothing with which to feed our families and that has sent our children to the streets. They have become street children because they do not have what to do and we, their parents, do not have enough to take care of them. The DRC's armed forces have failed to stop the violence in this eastern region. Rights group warn that a crisis looms for the future of the children, as they are without supervision, no education, and are accustomed to daily violence and abuse. Tuli Shabalala, CGTN. Let's take a short break. Your business news up next. Coming up, the International Monetary Fund projects global GDP will shrink by 3% this year. 
And estimated global airline losses from the coronavirus pandemic climbed to $312 billion. Africa is the nexus of enterprise, and global business will tell you why it matters. From the mega investment projects to multi-billion dollar mergers and acquisitions. Africa today collects, just in terms of revenues from taxes alone, $545 billion a year. If you take 10% of that and you devote it to the energy sector, problem solved. All this on global business weekdays at this time on CGTN. Africa Live. Find your voice. Business news now. The International Monetary Fund projects global GDP will shrink by 3% this year, the deepest recession since the Great Depression in the 1930s. This is the organization's first World Economic Outlook report since COVID-19 forced countries around the world to freeze their economies. Charles Gibson has more. The IMF is calling global restrictions to contain COVID-19 the Great Lockdown. Good morning, everyone. And the organization's chief economist laid out how the lockdown is hammering economies all over the world. The magnitude and speed of collapse in activity that has followed is unlike anything experienced in our lifetimes. This is a crisis like no other, which means there is substantial uncertainty about the impact it will have on people's lives and livelihoods. The fund says the U.S. economy will contract by almost 6 percent this year and emerging markets and developing economies by a combined 1 percent. Italy, the hardest hit country in Europe from COVID-19, is expected to see its economy shrink by more than 9 percent. According to the fund, China's GDP will still grow in 2020, but only by a modest 1.2 percent. It's a stark reversal to what we heard in January, when the IMF predicted global GDP would expand by more than 3 percent this year. The U.S. Capitol would normally be full of economists, journalists and finance ministers for the IMF World Bank spring meetings, but this year the events have gone virtual. The IMF also released its latest global financial stability report on Tuesday, saying early interventions by central banks have been working so far. As a result of these actions, investor sentiment has stabilized in recent weeks. Strains in some markets have abated somewhat, and risk asset prices have recovered a portion of their earlier declines. Sentiment continues to be fragile, however. The IMF is projecting 5.8% global growth for next year, but only if the pandemic fades away in the second half of 2020. Giles Gibson, CGTN, Washington. Meanwhile, the International Monetary Fund has approved $1 billion in emergency funding for Ghana and $442 million for Senegal. The funds will help the West African countries address urgent fiscal and balance of payments needs and catalyze support from other development partners in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic. Now, this comes after the fund announced immediate debt relief for 25 countries across the world. The debt relief will be funded by the IMF's Catastrophe Containment and Relief Trust. The trust was first set up to combat the West Africa Ebola outbreak in 2015 and has been repurposed to help countries fend off COVID-19. Well, CGTN's Colette Wanjoi takes a look at other countries that stand to benefit from the IMF Coronavirus Fund. The African countries that will benefit from the debt relief include Rwanda, the Central African Republic and the Democratic Republic of Congo. The IMF says the relief worth about $215 million should be able to cover their IMF debt obligations for an initial phase of over the next six months. There's also a possibility to extend it to two years. The relief will help countries to channel more of their resources towards vital medical uh, facilities as well as other relief efforts. The African Union has also called for comprehensive stimulus package for Africa, including deferred payments and the immediate suspension of interest payments on Africa's external and public and private debt. 
Ethiopia has also uh, asked for about $150 billion in health financing and budgetary support from the World Bank for the whole continent during this COVID-19 period. The UN Economic Commission for Africa is only projecting economic recovery uh, after about 24 to 36 months. It also says that the continent needs about $100 billion in immediate emergency financing for COVID-19 response. Koleto Anjohi, CGTN, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Estimated global airline losses from the coronavirus pandemic have climbed to $312 billion, which is 25% more than previously forecast. Now, this is a result of the severity of the economic downturn and a slower than previously expected reopening of international routes. The latest forecast from the International Air Transport Association is up from the $252 billion figure given on March 24th and represents a 55% drop in 2020 passenger revenue compared with last year. Alexandre de Junaik, the airline body's director general, said that airlines are fighting for survival. Beyond the open-ended lockdowns and travel bans, deep uncertainty remains over the pace of an eventual recovery. In Kenya, the flower export industry is feeling the impact of the coronavirus pandemic. Exports are reeling from operational losses as hundreds of workers count job losses due to a downward shift in demand. Terry Wangari has the details. Kenya is among the world's top flower producers due to its top-tier climate. But demand has in recent times been on the decline following the outbreak of the coronavirus. Situated 40 minutes from the central business district, Redlands Roses is among the firms reeling from the downshift in orders and demand. So beginning March, we started seeing a reduction in terms of the orders that were being made. By the time we got to around 20th of March, we were almost at 15% of our normal supply to Europe especially. And the other markets, of course, you know, followed suit. Like many other farms in Kenya, Redlands Roses has been forced to dump 4,000 to 20,000 stems of roses on a daily basis. The giant lumps of flowers gradually rot and turn into fertilizer, resulting in tremendous losses to the farm. So the management had to sit down and figure out how are we going to survive through these tough times. Because regardless of whether there is their orders or not, there are still operational costs at the farm. Normally, staff work here for six days a week, so now they can only work here part-time for three days a week. Despite this, there is a rising silver lining for the industry that could turn around the fate of the perishable commodity. In the last uh, uh, three weeks, we have seen that market uh, uh, opening up as we have seen the number of uh, infections in, uh, in China dropping. So the demand has also come up. The Chinese market is an important market for us. It's a market that uh, uh, we have grown and we are continuing to grow. Since we got our last order from China, which was towards the beginning or end of January, there has been no order from China this whole time until now in April. So last week on Sunday, we got our first order from China, which was a really good thing. So last week we got an order of um, 15 boxes, yeah, which, which is a really big improvement. Yeah, so hopefully things are getting better. Despite Asian markets representing a small glimmer of hope, the industry is facing a cumbersome challenge. It doesn't have enough freighters to transport all these orders. So the new issue that we are dealing with, we have orders, but we cannot service the market because we do not have enough cargo planes to ferry our flowers from Nairobi to all those destinations. We have a capacity of about uh, uh, 1,200 tons at the moment, yet the demand is at about 3,500 tons. The revival of the industry could mean workers who lost their jobs could now be employed again. All that remains is for stakeholders to figure out a way to boost freight capacity to elevate the sector. Terry Wangari, CGTN. Well, COVID-19 certainly doesn't discriminate when it comes to draining the life out of businesses. Companies big and small are simply trying to find a way forward. In the United States, many thought business interruption insurance would see them through a crisis like a pandemic. But unfortunately, they were wrong. CGTN's Sean Caleb's reports from High Point, North Carolina. 
thank you for choosing barbecue Joe's. Times are lean at Joe's Barbecue. Oh, the brisket is still tender and juicy. There just aren't as many people buying it these days. Well, the frustration hit right when they told me that I was going to have to shut my dining room and fear. But I had to take a deep breath and let that go. Joe Housen has also had to let go one third of his 100 employees at his two restaurants after sales plunged 40%. Now he depends solely on drive through. Housen thought he was covered by business interruption insurance. Yeah, you would think, you you know, it's all all good, but I, I don't know what to, what happened on that. Uh, but it's it's no hope, you know, with a business interruption. You know, uh, it's it's not there. Here in High Point, North Carolina, Joe spent about two years working on a business plan before opening. He was banking on business interruption insurance to get him through tough times. Well, now his best hopes rest with the federal stimulus package. And if that doesn't come through, well, the future could be as empty as these streets. Paula Wells has been Joe's attorney since he opened nearly 15 years ago. She helped Housen navigate his way through the federal package for the Payroll Protection Program, or PPP. The Payroll Protection Plan is basically a loan that you may not have to pay back, depending on all kinds of stipulations. There were also a host of last minute changes to the measure that basically fueled a nightmare on Elm, Commerce, and every other street. Wells has been inundated and is swamped with business. Okay, would you like Joe's sauce on it or on this side? Her chief counsel to clients right now has been, do what you need to stay open. I'm not hearing anger yet. I just think this came so fast and it's so different than anything before. And I gotta keep my confidence up because I've got my employees that are looking at me. And if they see me down and out and depressed, then they're gonna get that way. Thank you. These days, cleaning supplies are in such demand, Housen keeps them in the restaurant rather than simply in a supply hut outside. Losing his catering and dine-in business has taken a mammoth bite out of profits. And if things weren't bleak enough, he knows the worst is yet to come. Sean Caleb's CGTN, High Point, North Carolina. And let's go to Egypt now, where to entertain people staying at home during COVID-19, the Egyptian Tourism and Antiquities Ministry is now focusing on virtual tours of its museums. The online campaign is themed Experience Egypt from Home. CGTN's Adel El Mahroui explains. Egypt thrives on tourism. And despite that COVID-19 deprived the North African nation from its visitors, Egypt decided to send its priceless ancient treasures to people staying at home. It launched a series of virtual reality tours of museums and artifacts. We want to stay in the memory of people, in the mind of people. So we sponsored this uh, uh, slogan, uh, uh, stay home, stay safe. The Egyptian government decided we're not going to sit and wait we will continue working and telling the people we are uh, uh, preparing sites, we are uh, working on everything, we are maintaining uh, the, grand, the Grand Egyptian Museum is, is showing a great progress. El Batuti is one of the contributors to this first of its kind virtual tour. He is presenting guided video tours which are part of this huge online campaign the Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities is launching. The veteran tour guide and his colleagues are responsible to put the spotlights on a collection of Egypt's hidden gems. We're in also showing people the beauty that the museum has a zillions of other pieces that people never had the chance because of the, 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 the King Tut exhibit was there. And we showed the, the, uh, the collection from Tanis, and this is a, a, as good as King Tut's uh, collection. It's so beautiful. So, uh, yes, you're right. We're enlightening some of the pieces that people pass by and went over their head. They never saw this. So we're showing the beauty of other pieces. Real 3D tours of tombs, temples and museums from across the country are now online. All virtual tours are free and available to anyone in the world at the Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities page on Facebook. Egypt knows that one day the COVID-19 lockdown will be lifted. Life will go back to normal and people will start planning their trips. These virtual tours are considered an early marketing campaign 
to inspire travelers about their next destination. Adele Mahrui, CGTN, Cairo. And here's what's coming up in your sports news up next. 2017 London Marathon champion Daniel Wanjiru provisionally suspended by the Athletics Integrity Unit.